Recording in progress. All right. Good right. Good, good morning. Good night, depending on where in the world you are joining in to tonight's AI Green Lab. I'm happy to say that I am back in Cat Island for this third session, and we are getting ready to dive into all things AI and how we can apply it into our everyday life. So today, of course, as usual, we have our lead of the AI Green Lab, Abby Shimelis Goshu, who is going to take over and give us an update on what has been happening with the AI Green Lab. Over to you, Abby. All right. Thank you, Nikita. Can you hear me very well? Yeah, excellent. So hello, everyone. Uh, greetings. Um, my name is Abby. I'm uh, currently working as the campaign lead for the Action for Peace 2030. I'm also working as the project communication lead, as the uh, project communication lead for the Digital Center of Excellence here at the Economic Commission for Africa. I'm based here in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, but, and then for this session, I am facilitating the AI Green Lab session with my colleague, Nikita. We're talking and discussing about how we can leverage emerging technologies, particularly AI in this case, to fast track some of our social innovations, our uh, sustainable development objectives. And yeah, how do we use AI for good? That's the bottom center of the uh, whole conversation. As it's been three weeks, uh, we've had two sessions um, so far. And then a field visit in between, which I had uh, an amazing experience uh, traveling to the Bahamas, Cat Island, first time in the Caribbean, uh, joining and seeing the ocean nation and the islands and uh, all the beautiful things uh, that the Caribbean has to offer to the world. But most importantly, uh, meeting the uh, research team at the uh, Young Marine Explorers at YME. Uh, in which we are trying to develop research questions that as they lead from, as they develop from the conversations we've been having in the last two sessions. So just to walk you through, for those of you joining for the first time, or uh, maybe want to have a quick overview on how far we have come on this AI Green Lab sessions, uh, let me just quickly walk you through. Um, an overview, I have a presentation over here. So let me know if you can see it. Yep, we can see it. All right. We can see it. It's Excellent. not so perfect. It's in presenter mode. It's in presenter mode. All right. So the first uh, session, we were basically trying to understand what is AI and how does it show up in our lives, basic definitions and how it relates to sustainable development. Why are we um, jointly asking these two questions and they're exploring their interlinkages. Second session had to do with identifying social impacts of AI and how it contributes to the discussion of social innovation. And today, we are on our third session in which we're trying to explore the practical applications um, and future opportunities of AI. So we're getting more, uh, diving more deeper into these practical applications. But before I go further deep into that, uh, let me show you also um, the recent visit we've had, I've had um, the chance to visit in Cat Island as part of this learning process. Let me know if you can see my screen, Nikita. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So we, it was a good experience to meet with the, some of the teams we've, uh, I've had uh, the chance to connect so far virtually. And uh, we we were kind of, this was the first planning meeting uh, at Goodman's Bay in Nassau. And 
visiting the team in uh, with the YME team. I see Anthony's already joined here, which is excellent. Jade, Dr. Brandon, uh, Darren, and uh, a lot of a lot of amazing people uh, doing different amazing things and uh, who are curious also, equally curious on how AI applies in their daily lives and how we can better leverage on its some of its potentials. And basically exploring the intersection of AI, sustainable development, social impact, all of these uh, as, as outlined in the objective. So for those of you joining in these sessions for the first time this link would be available for you i'll join i'll um shortly share them on the chat group or on the whatsapp group we we have i'll just be dropping the link um here for the purpose of new audience but also uh we can we're going to be also sharing this this um update widely on our mailing list so there are a couple of um, learning points uh, we narrowed down on, particularly in shaping the research questions uh, around AI and how we want to better leverage it for our different contextual needs. Uh, for that, uh, before going to Glenys' presentation, uh, we have a guest speaker today, Glenys. I'll properly introduce her and um, and as it relates to today's topic, practical applications of AI. But the conversation before that, before doing that, basically the conversation um, revolved around basically acknowledging the potential of AI's growth in the global market. As you can see, these are figures talking about how vast these opportunities, uh, the AI presents opportunities to tap into the knowledge economy. As you can see, 15.7 trillion to be contributed to the global economy by 2030, as the figures show. And even if you look at uh, the global south, the projection seems to be very vast. But the, at the bottom, the at the end of the day, uh, the question is how can we be part of this knowledge economy? Is the bit is the main question we're trying to address. But how do we do that exactly? So. We identified three basic focus areas during this discussion. Um, having visited, going all the way to Cat Island, seeing the local context and how the island life itself, um, you know, 700 islands scattered, um, caves and rocks and islands scattered all over the Caribbean. And it's, it's kind of made me wonder personally, it's kind of further made me question the role of AI in communication, especially when uh, communities are separated by uh, distance and various geographical and logistic barriers that might have. The second is AI's role for good data. How do how does AI? Um, what is AI? Uh, well, how do we understand the applications of AI? when we're in data collection, analysis of data, which I'm sure Glenys' presentation will have interesting things to share with us and from her experience as well. Um, and then at the third, if we have time today for the reflection uh, session later on we're gonna have, is to dive into the AI and its applications in co-creating art, culture and heritage and the, generally the preservation and sharing and the production of knowledge and how we transfer institutional um, information, inf institutional knowledge from generation to generation. So these are the three things. So um, when it comes to AI for communication, uh, we, as you can see, there's a lot of talk about how we are greening our education. What does that even mean? How are we transforming how we learn? Right now, we're different people. I'm sitting here in the continent of Africa, different time zone. Um, Glenys is joining from the UK in Reading. You have uh, Nikita and Anthony's from the Bahamas. and so. But still, we are trying to understand these things and create a learning environment. Um, a couple of weeks back, it, we were learning in an island. 
we're discussing how to create an island um, university and uh, an island learning classroom. It was a, basically for me, it was an island classroom, right? You know, uh, visiting the sanctuary, Nikita sanctuary and the YME um, base and the different learning uh, materials you guys have, visiting the Manofor heritage sites um, and also meeting different uh, interesting people in the ocean observation space. But at the end of the day, um, as you can see, it's a global virtual team, right? Like we later on after Glenice's presentation, we're going to dive further into um, the, we're going to reflect further on how AI can leverage and supplement our communication needs. How do virtual teams even work? How, how can we further um, use these technologies to help us communicate better, share files and knowledge quicker? And this is basically at the center of changing how we learn, changing education from ground up. So there are different cases, uh, extend AI extension tools. Um, there is also, for those who are into writing, there are different extension tools that support. I mean, just if you just check these examples, for example, there's a chat GPT extension tool, which helps you summarize videos and all of these things. I mean, and then you have the Grammarly applications. There's so many examples. This is just scratching the surface, but at the bottom, uh, the bottom line is um, how, how are we fast tracking these uh, uh, you know, how are we, how, how, how's AI supporting the work that we do while we focus on our core competencies? Um, so that's one of the reflection points uh, for today. Uh, the second thing we focus during uh, these past few sessions and uh, the field work is data, AI for data. Acknowledge that we are in a data gold rush and there's a lot of interest in interest in accumulating uh, data, quality data, and especially at, at scale. And these are just examples of different companies, startups who are focused on uh, accumulating data for uh, different functions. So data could be, could also be, data could also be geospatial data. So we're gonna see, we're gonna reflect uh, more on that as well. Uh, so let me just pause here. This is just an overview of the focus we've been having these past uh, few weeks. So to just summarize it for you, uh, I'll just go back in the slides. It's all about communication, data, and arts, culture, and heritage, uh, and AI in all of these three applications. So I'll just pause here for now, and I'll let... Uh, Glenys, I'll introduce Glenys quickly. So Glenys uh, brings an interesting perspective in this conversation. I know she's gonna introduce herself properly um, as well, but I'm also excited to hear more about her study, uh, her master's program in climate change and uh, AI and how it applies in these conversations and uh, and some of her insights uh, she has on the subject. So, Glenys, thank you for joining us and I'll hand it over to you. You're muted, Glenys. Yeah, I see that. So, hi everybody. Um, thank you, Nikita and Abby, for um, inviting me and um, giving me the opportunity to have this talk. Um, so let me put my slide up while I'm uh, chatting here. Okay, let me make sure this can run. Okay, everybody can see the slide change. Okay, great. So hi, I'm Glenys McKenzie. Um, I, like Nikita, I'm from the Bahamas. And right now I am currently in the UK and I am working on my second master's degree. <laughs> um, but this master's degree is now in climate change and AI. So I think that um, there's a lot that we could do um, in that space. And I'm looking forward to be able to be a part of that. Um, 
So but for right now, this presentation um, that we have here, Practical Applications and Future Opportunities of AI, um, I want to just share with you some of the things that I just kind of pulled out from this topic. It is a very large topic, okay? Even if we cut this in half, this is still a large topic. So I do hope that um, you would get something of value from what I'm going to present here today. Um, so just a brief overview of the outline here. Um, well, Abby already kind of gave a bit of a uh, recap in any way, but we're just going to have a short recap of what is artificial intelligence and machine learning and how is it applied to our everyday life, just so we get a reminder that it is already here. It's a part of everything we do. And we don't really think about how ingrained it's actually been for some time. I think chat GPT kind of, you know, and um, also the generative AI with mid journey, just kind of put it to the forefront, but it's been around for a long time. And also what are the future opportunities um, using AI? What kind of sectors um, are growing? Um, and also ethical use is very important. And then practical applications, because when we think of AI, you know, we think of Terminator, robots, <laughs> um, you know, some something automated machine, physical like. Uh, we don't always think about the software, or the other sort of applications um, that could be used. So I do hope that this would give you a broad sense. And I don't know if I'll be able to answer all of your questions, um, but we'll see where we get. Um, so. What is artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, AI, ML? Um, so just a recap here. Machine learning is this branch of computer science concerned with the development of um, statistical algorithms that can uh, effectively generalize. And what generalized means is that, okay, if I created a solution to this problem, I don't need that algorithm to only solve this problem. I need it to have a little bit of leeway so that when I apply it to another, say if I design something to detect a disease in a person, I need to be able to detect this in somebody else too, or another group, or, you know, if I have to tweak something, it's just a few things. So that's what it means to generalize. It's like, I could take this and I could um, do more with it than just this one case I trained it on. Um, and building intelligent systems or machines that could perform capable tasks, um, that perform tasks that usually humans um, do. So whether that be the tasks that we like to do or don't like to do, but, um, they would assist us in that. No, I do need to, ah, this, I can move this, great. Sorry, just make an adjustment on my screen. Okay, so, let's have a look at some of the different technologies just to kind of give us a reminder. Smartphone technology, we have both our, voice rec and facial recognition. We could see that all of that um, features, the phones are able to recognize um, fraud pre prevention. We use our credit cards and ideally we prefer that it doesn't decline us when we're making a legitimate purpose. But the idea is that um, it's supposed to classify what is normal behavior and what is abnormal behavior. Um, you know, we have online shopping. You know that when you buy something on Amazon, sometimes it recommends other things to you. Uh, ideally, before you made the purchase, <laughs> uh, sometime, or Netflix, so they recommend uh, the next movie uh, based on maybe what people in the region are watching, also your past history. It's taking information and it's producing a result. Um, security systems, which have advanced quite a bit. So instead of your alarm going off for everything that moves, um, aka your cat and your dog, uh, now it's more advanced that it could pick out a human form. So all of these things we've been using around us that incorporate um, the tools of AI. So future opportunities. All right, so these are some of the sectors that are rapidly advancing. So as we think about it, um, if AI is already ingrained in our lives so much. What does it look like for the future? What does it look like for those sectors to grow and improve? Uh, we're already seeing uh, a lot of um, automated services right now. Um, right now in the UK, I was surprised of how prevalent the um, self-service checkout is. Um, one store I went to, 
the larger one had an option, which I was very grateful for. I was like, I don't know how to use it. I don't feel like doing that right now. <laughs> and then the, I went to a smaller version. And I was like, that's your only option. I'm like, great. So whether we like it or not, we're kind of being forced to actually use some of this technology and it's growing. And some of it we like a lot, like for um, the advances that are um, happening in health with um, disease recognition or being able to recognize tumor or to do surgeries, all of these things that help to extend our lives and produce a lot of benefit. Um, you're also seeing a lot of different, um, sometimes on my LinkedIn feed and everything, I see these advances um, with technology and agriculture, like um, disease recognition, where I could see, okay, the leaves of this plant is using image recognition to be able to tell this plant has disease. So now it knows that we need to treat this before it spreads or the weed killer that the, that's able to um, detect what's the plant and what's the weed. So it's growing in a lot of different areas. And also meteorology and climate change as well. Um, it's developing. Um, and there's so many different areas, you can't even list them all where AI is advancing. But thankfully, other people have done research. Remember, we stand on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> so um, this um, slide here, this uh, image is from McKinsey and Company. So they did some research and their analysis indicates, uh, like Abby has already shown you a slide, that um, AI is having a huge impact um, on these different sectors. And because there's a lot of value that AI can actually provide um, in these sectors. And from this, this graph here, you can see that uh, there's still room to grow. Um, if you think about pharmaceutical and medical products, only about less than 30% of this, um, this value here, uh, this what, is around like 100 billion in impact here. And that's just less than 30%. So, the, if you were to do some research in pharmaceuticals and how that could benefit uh, human life, there's room to grow uh, in terms of revenue or impact. Um, retail, as we know, we see retail has taken a huge lead in um, utilizing all the different tools of AI. So it is over 600 billion uh, impact in revenue here. And it's still not even 50% um, of that. So there's a lot of uh, different sectors that are utilizing AI and that revenue is being generated in uh, uh, different forms of value. Um, agriculture we see here and insurance, energy with the oil and gas and chemicals and travel. So when we think about how this is advancing so quickly. And I, I'm sure on the news, we would have seen a lot of fuss about it because mostly of the generative AI. Um, <laughs> I It's my understanding that a lot of universities are very sensitive about, some are trying to incorporate it in to get ahead of the curve, but many are just saying, don't touch it. I don't, make sure it's not in your reports. Um, don't use it for um, your essays. And uh, so it's, some people have a don't go anywhere near it approach. And some people, uh, like I said, are trying to get ahead of the curve. So with all these advancements, the question a lot of people are asking is, should we be afraid? Should we be afraid of AI? Should we be afraid that we're advancing too quickly? Um, there's a lot of different fears going around. And one of those primary fears is, will AI take your job? <laughs> so that's one question that some people are asking, is AI gonna take my job? Um, am I gonna be displaced? And the, answer, the reply is kind of mixed. So here's a question for you all. Let me start the Mentimeter. So I wanted you to ask yourself, how do you feel about talking to an automated system or chat box when you, uh, chat bot when you need customer service help? Do we have the link in the chat box? I'm dropping the link on the chat box. All right. Oh. And then you can use the code on the screen. Yeah, so please use the code, um, the QR code, or the uh, you can go to mentimedia.com and you can type in the code. And I've started the slide, so hopefully uh, everybody can see that. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, oops, went too far. How do you feel about talking to an automated system in chatbots? Good night. I'm sorry. When we go on Menti Meetup, which one are you looking for? Um. So when you go on Menti Meetup, you should see um a question slide asking you the question: How do you feel about talking to an automated system? Uh, or chatbot when you need customer help and there should be a little square box where you could type in your response so you can so if you like talking to those little chat box in the computer um you can mm -hmm. type it. if you hate it because it never can solve your problem it's like you hate it well i i will look for it now but to answer that question now i i hate it <laughs> okay. i prefer talking to a human <laughs> Okay. okay, thank you for your reply. But I'll look for this stuff right now. <laughs> if that link works for you, Antonise, I think that might take you to the direct question page. Okay. I also hate it. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna give that a few seconds more. So I see that everybody hates it, okay. And that they find it annoying. So the words I see here are hate and annoying. Now I know I should share my other screen, but I don't wanna risk coming out of this. Um. Okay, so let me go to the next slide here. Would you rather speak to someone possibly uninformed and rude or to an efficient automated customer service system? If you're just joining us, you can use the link um, on the screen or I'll reshare it. We're just answering some questions. So, um, Feel free to connect on that and join along in the this session. It's there's no right or wrong answer. Okay, I'm going to um, just stop sharing. I think it would be good for people to see the Mentimeter, or is it possible for me to? also share that at the same time let me see now uh, now i'll just leave it <laughs> Lenisa, if if it's if it's something that you can do, it would be good for people to see what okay. um just because like I'm really visual, so I have no idea what unless I see it, it doesn't register for me. So um, some of the people may learn the same way. All right, let me stop sharing and okay, um you guys can continue answering and I will pull up the Mentimeter. So for those who just jumped in, we're reflecting on how we like to engage with those um, AI chat bots that often pop up if you're talking to a business or you go to a website or you call the phone and a machine answers. So we're, uh, we're exploring that now. And I think Glenise is gonna share some results based on wh what we, we shared. All right, and I will start sharing again. So this slide and this one. Okay, so everybody can see the slide? The Mentimeter? Okay, great. So just to show you the previous results, no human touch, I hate it, annoying, confident, uncertain, 
And so far, one person in response to the, would you rather speak to someone possibly uninformed and rude or to an efficient automated customer service system? <laughs> Everybody wants to take their chances with the human. <laughs> And um, one person prefer a mixture of human and AI. Okay, great. So let me just go back to my presentation here. But while I'm going there, I want you to keep this thought in mind. If you were a small business owner or even a large company and you realize that your very rude staff, who despite your best efforts are still being rude, is costing you money. And if you found out that the AI, the chat box is actually working, uh, your customer have, they have satisfied, they're satisfied with the results. They're able to get the information they need. Would you then still keep the humans on staff? So it's an interesting thing when you look at it from the perspective of the employer or the owner of the company. So, to answer the question, will AI take your job? It depends on what your job is. Um, AI is increasing greatly in the area of automation. So if you work in the area of automation, like the um, uh, sale, the um, yeah, like the checkout counter, um, the sales lady actually said to me, yeah, they're trying to replace us with these. So we're not actually allowed to really help you as they want. So, yeah, so I was like, oh, so she had to help me so many times, <laughs> but, if you do work in some of these areas where they are trying to automate, um, yeah, actually it is possible that you might lose your job. But um, so they're saying, according to McKinsey and company again, that um, on one end of the spectrum, you could have about 4 million workers that could be displaced by automation by somewhere between 2016 and 2030. And then in the slowest adoption model, so if AI is you know, more, becomes a little bit more regulated, then maybe about 10 million people will be displaced. Um, well, they said is close to 0%, but it, it matters depending on which side of the percentage you're on. <laughs> so it's kind of yes and no, because it is growing in such that there are a lot of opportunities and, and tons of jobs that are being created actually, but there are some that are being lost. So it's more like it's shifting. So when we keep in mind this whole shift um, in dynamics, we have to surround us all in the ethical use of AI. And so a, there's still some challenges. And one of the things we have to do when we use AI is we have to work on overcoming the bias that exists. And because of sometimes when the information that it's feeding off of, for example, if you were to Google successful businessman or a successful business person, what's the image that you're more than likely going to get? You're going to get a certain race, and you're going to get a certain gender. And that may not be the image that people want to have, but that's the image that is out there. And if the machines are feeding in an all that visual image and they're going to produce a result you don't like. And when that happens, somebody has to take responsibility for it. Um, personally, I don't believe in all, the, all of the bashing and shaming because, you know, <laughs> Everything evolves and grows, but the reality is you do have to take responsibility. You can't ignore that uh, because it has consequences. Because what happens when somebody gets um, convicted for a crime they didn't commit based on a misclassification? Um, you know, the police show up at their home or something like that because, you know, it looked like them close enough. Uh, or with the self-driving cars, what happens when that crashes? Who's responsible for that? Uh, so all of these things we have to think about in an ethical sense. Um, and then also approving the reliability of the AI systems and, and products. Um, so making sure that the car can recognize people <laughs> from the trees or from something else or, or even a dog. <laughs> um, and then improving transparency in this whole process. So let's look at some practical applications. Now, keep in mind that all of this is shrouded in ethics, whatever you do. Um, and so, that, that should be a guiding factor always. But the next thing I wanna draw attention to is data literacy. And this is really important because uh, we forget that uh, all those little basic skills that, you know, sometimes we wanna jump in the deep end and we don't realize that when it comes to machine learning and AI, it's garbage in, garbage out. You feed the, the, the AI, um, your predictive model, a bunch of unclean data that has a lot of nonsense in it. Don't be surprised if it gives you out foolishness. 
you have to have some data cleaning skills. You need to be able to understand how to look at data, how to consider your outliers, um, how to do some basic statistics, um, even how to just do research. So you get on the computer and you don't know how to do something. How do you Google that? Do you go put a whole sentence in your Google bar? Or do you look for some keywords and phrases? Um, and then when Google is not the only um, platform you could search in. Sometimes I deliberately search within YouTube and not within um, Google itself because I'm looking for a tutorial. And sometimes there's a ton of nonsense out there. So um, keeping all that in mind, uh, everybody can jump in at different points. And so I, for, from the beginning and work on your computer literacy, um, work on understanding how to do research, work on, work on understanding how to use Excel, um, other basic programs, work on your problem solving skills. How do you solve a problem? How do you, um, if you need to solve a problem, how are you going to research? Are you going to look for a textbook? Are you going to, you know, watch a tutorial? How do you deal with that? Um, communication, how do you communicate your insights, your findings? Because you could do all of the fancy designs you want, but when you time to present your business model to someone, you need to be able to have the communication skills to do that well. And then critical thinking, when you're presented with a problem, how do you design a solution to be able to formulate, to approach that problem and get an optimal solution? And you have to be creative because sometimes what you try the first time doesn't work. So you also need to be persistent. Um, so on the deep, getting on the deeper end, learning a program, programming languages like R, Python, SQL. Personally, I recommend Python. There's a lot of different applications you could use that for. Um, you need to be able to do data cleaning and data visualizations. Data visualization enables you to be able to see what your data is doing so that you can remove any sort of nonsense that might be there. And you might be surprised at what is there. Uh, that might be interesting and offer great business insight. And so business intelligence relies a lot on um, data visualization, data analysis, and data mining. Um, there's tons of machine learning algorithms. Uh, there's no way I could have listed them all in this little <laughs> slide here. So um, you could do a quick little Google search once again to look at the long list of machine algorithms that are out there and deep learning as well as cloud computing. I just want to make sure that you could visually see the type of things that are out there. So here's another poll question. Where can you find resources to help you learn the skills you need to um, enter the field of AI or to use AI technology? And how much do you need, need to pay to obtain these skills? So let me make sure I'm on that slide. Oh, Nikita, how much time do I have left? Um, one second, keep going, I'll let you know. Okay, <laughs> great. So yeah, so if you could just join in, well, um, hopefully you still kept your window open and um, you could just answer this first question for me, please. Where can you find the resources to help you learn the skills you need to enter the field of AI or use AI technology? All right, can we wrap it up in about six-ish minutes? I'll do my best. All right. <laughs> Well, with that, I know we started a bit late, so. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so that means I won't wait too long in this question. Sorry. <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna um, give it. Are you seeing the question or? I am seeing the question. Um, I don't see any responses yet. Uh, wait, let me go to okay. the, uh, let me go over here. Go to slide. So yeah. where can you find resources to help you learn the skills you need to enter the field of AI? Is that the one? Or use yeah. AI technology? Yeah, okay. this is the slide that I'm on now. All right. Okay, Google Books, great. Google, YouTube, awesome, online, brilliant. Okay, I'm just gonna give it 10 more seconds. <laughs> online free courses, awesome. Not short, that's great. We'll sort you out shortly. AI Green, <laughs> awesome. 
friends. That's true. AI chat. Awesome. Yeah. TikTok. Okay. I have not seen that. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go back to the presentation. You guys can keep sending in. That's awesome. Thank you. And uh, the next one is here. Uh, how much skills do you think you need to pay? And in the meantime, I'm going to go back to my presentation since I've been given six minutes. Um, but you can answer that. And if we have time, we'll get back to it. Oops. Um, okay. Let me present again. All right. So these are the places you can learn. YouTube, Coursera. Coursera edX, they have... Um, the, op the uh, option to edit. So you might see sometime where they see the certification, there's a little button right there that underneath in small types of font that says audit, click it, learn. Um, there's also Kaggle, uh, fast.ai. So they have YouTube videos as well as their online platform. There are big names in this, IBM, Google, Microsoft that have free courses that you can use. Um, and when you get certifications from these, I mean, who's going to argue with these companies? So use the resources that are out there. Um, Udemy, I personally do like Udemy because um, you can get some courses there, especially when they have their sales for like anywhere from $9.99 to like what, $15 or more. And um, some of those teachers are experts and I really do enjoy some of the classes. Now there is some rubbish so you have to filter, but they really do have some good courses. Skillshare, I also like because you have to consider that some people that want to use AI, not everybody wants to build robots. Some people might want to use it for graphic design, uh, content or media. Some people are designers and artists. And some of the other platforms don't really speak to that as it were. But Skillshare is a great place for artists. So I really like that. Um, LinkedIn Learning is a great place as well if you have that subscription. Coursera and edX. So if you pay for, uh, this isn't that um, too much, but if you, you pay, you can also get a certification. And these courses are run by universities. So that's also great as well. And then on the higher cost options, you have coding boot camps. And of course, you get a university degree. Um, one thing I want to note is that we are pretty Sorry? Can I just interject that no one said university or school in the little, when we ah. in your on, uh, <laughs> to learn about AI. I just mm -hmm. think that's an interesting observation. That is, that is so. true. That is interesting. <laughs> Uh, and I'm glad that people do see that you have other options because these degrees are expensive. And especially if you don't have a passport for the country that you want to spend in, I personally feel that's slightly unethical ethical to have something like five times the price but I digress I'm not going to get on that one <laughs> uh, I'm going to skip this slide here but the reality is is that we are pretty behind in um, parts of Africa and the Caribbean Latin America we uh, in terms of being able to use the full potential of AI that's the gist of this slide um, in terms of what we could use for our region specifically I think it's important for us to realize that we could use this in emergency response, water safety detection, agriculture sector has already been mentioned, health. Um, we already said that we have a, sh a shortage of nurses or shortage of doctors or certain expertise. Imagine how much assistance AI could bring if we were to start incorporating that into our area and try to also catch a lot of diseases um, or cancers before they actually really advance. Um, so I tried to put these in these different columns so people could see that, okay, you have the generative AI that can help with art, design, marketing, image classification, and flood monitoring, uh, um, agriculture again, um, so many different options. And so in moving from this uh, consumer to creator, um, this is an example and um, the source, I also have a resource in the resources um, where you have this, this uh, flood classification or flood mapping where you are getting this information about floods and you're seeing where the floods actually happen and then you're being able to use um, satellite data rem uh, remote sensing and then do image um, then you're doing your your deep learning to be able to do the image classification and from that information that process also using regression and classification you can see where which areas are likely to flood and then you could 
map out a zone. It's like, okay, this is a flood hazard zone here. Uh, if a hurricane is coming, for example, um, these are the areas that have the greatest potential of flood. Move these people, you know, we have another Dorian or we have um, uh, one of the other, the, another category five, four or five, um, or, or any storm. That, because, you know, as we know, there's some parts of Nassau that flood, no matter what, <laughs> uh, even with just basic rain. So this could help us in understanding where to build. So you think about your land use and planning uh, mapping or your, in terms of climate change, think about um, your deforestation, seeing what's happening uh, and the changes of your, of your country or your region. Um, so there's a lot of different applications. So I have these resources here. Um, and once again, if you can't copy this, you could just Google. And there are some online uh, in YouTube. Keep an eye out for um, the uh, the creator's website. Uh, you know, take advantage of all the resources that are presented to you. That description box is useful. A lot of times they have the codes that they use available as they want people to practice. Look in the description box, click on it, get the codes. They, it links to GitHub and practice. Uh, some people are are nice enough to even respond to you when you have questions um, because they're interested in people using their products or going to their school or they just want people to learn a lot of there's more people than you think that want people to advance um, in using these tools to be able to help their region um, or even personally at just advance in the knowledge and growth of AI and technology. So um, hopefully I was within that six minutes, but let's check out the um, results of our Mentimeter poll. Wow, everybody's on the low end here. <laughs> Okay, so um, nobody's expecting to play over 30,000 or even in the thousands. So that is fascinating. We have well, a bunch no one's of- No going to university to learn. <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems so, it seems so, but um, that, that that's great economic, that's great business sense. <laughs> think about like as someone who is going to university to learn about AI mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. what do you can you just sort of elaborate on sort of what you think just deeper on this question that you asked us okay that's a great that's question, a question actually. yeah it is a great question to be fair and um for me um this is a multifaceted issue um on the one hand uh I was studying some AI um, before, uh, especially during the pandemic, um, after I'd come back uh, from studying abroad in China, and then after I got introduced into the concept of, um, hey, you could kind of pivot and do data science, I was studying abroad, and I actually did learn quite a bit. Um, but what I also found is that there's some cultural, so this is one of the issues here, there's some uh, cultural stigma sometimes. And when, especially when you're trying to get a job in what the title of your degree says, and if you have a degree, um, especially in our region for the Caribbean, um, tight in, in that region, uh, the titles matter. Now, I already had a master's degree, um, in this case, in astrophysics, which you think would be interesting or say that, hey, you know, she has some brain cells that function. Um, <laughs> but I did have a huge amount of problems getting a job. Um, and because I had pivoted into the climate space. So I was always interested in meteorology. So I was a part of the meteorologists. I used to intern at the Met Office all the time. I was fascinated with the hurricanes. So on the one sense now, in terms of job wise, um, uh, it was, I found that it would have been extremely helpful for me to be able to have something that says, um, I'm doing, uh, climate science or meteorology. So, but when I saw that it had AI in it and I was, but I was a huge pusher of, of how machine learning could advance um, the, met, uh, the meteorology department and other aspects of, our, of the Bahamas. 
And when I saw that this program, this is actually a new program that I'm in. When I saw that this program exists and I saw the content of it, um, I was really intrigued. Now, the second part of that, um, the more positive end, comes in with the fact that I would personally like to do a PhD. I'd like to do um, a PhD in, now I probably could have gone straight off to the um, PhD. Yeah, that's a different story. Let's not go there. But um, I am really interested in hurricanes and I would actually really like to be able to apply machine learning techniques in um, being able to forecast hurricanes better and to uh, understanding their track and understanding how climate change is um, evolving, uh, causing them to intensify or understanding how that's affecting the dynamics of the climate in our region. Um, as I was working in the climate space, I saw a lot of models, but then um, there's not a, the problem is there's not a lot of data for our region. And then you can't really model something without data. <laughs> so that's another issue. That is another issue. Um, but we can make some approximations with um, machine learning. Uh, we can, if we use the satellite information, there are things that we can do. So um, to kind of optimize on what we do have. And that's kind of what I'm interested in. Now, how much I'll be able to do that time will tell as I approach, even with my master's thesis, if the information is there. But um, I think that machine learning could fill in a lot of gaps um, on, in technology that we don't have or optimizing what is available with um, in data from NOAA. Because when the hurricanes are passing by, of course, NOAA um, does track that information. It has satellite imagery. It has details about the storm. It has information from their, the, the planes that they flew in and everything. So there is some data that we could use and gather and be able to process. So um, if I have the opportunity to be able to do my PhD, which is money again, um, <laughs> hopefully I get some funding for that. Um, I would like to advance it. So I feel that the the grief fills, uh, fills two spaces. It can help me in terms of employment back in my region, um, if I, you know, from back in my region. And it also kind of gives me um, a solid base to continue on with my studies if I were to have the opportunity with now having a more firm base in both climate science and AI simultaneously. The wrong answer, I know. <laughs> I don't think there's any such thing as a wrong answer. It's just no. I said long. Sorry. <laughs> long. Okay. Yeah. I was just like, what was wrong about that? <laughs> no, no, no. Your point about titles matter depending on where you are, and who you are, and dare I say, what you look like. Mm. Um. You know. So as a black woman, the scrutiny that your CV receives is unfortunately um, often much more, uh, it's just unjust. What else does one say? You know, so we know that we have these biases that exist in the world. Um, and so this is part, the kind of like, I didn't think that we would get into feminist theory as we're talking about AI. However, <laughs> um, you know, often you hear sort of, uh, something that black women often say right is like you have to work 10 times harder you got to do all the things you got to do this work and the next work to just be seen right and so it's interesting i know a lot of caribbean and even african people who have multiple you know secondary like tertiary degrees and um awesome right but it also like just begs the question you know are we and I feel like so often, I know this is a bit of a tangent, but I think it's relevant to this conversation, but I think so many of us in our countries that are challenged to either be able to use the skill set that we currently have, or don't maybe necessarily understand yes. how our skill set can apply, um, they then, you know, you then sort of seek alternative opportunities to go out and educate yourself so that you become more competitive in the very niche, particular, limited, challenged market that is your home, right? Mm -hmm. So that, but then you become over-specialized. <laughs> so sometimes then you don't even want to return back to your home country 
Um, and so there sort of exacerbates the brain drain. So it's interesting. Um, I think it's just an interesting point for us to think about those of us who are, and I think everyone from this call is from right now the Caribbean or Africa. So we have very similar um, realities, although geographically differently located. Okay, I'm going to pause there. Abby, I'll, or Glenice, I'll let you guys go. I, I just want to make another comment. Like another reason that um, I'm really interested in getting the most out of this degree is um, I wanted to be placed in a position and have the skill set where um, I could do things fully and completely from one end to the next. Because what I found is that, you know, for the different projects that I'm involved in, um, I don't like leaving things half done. And I don't like things, <laughs> you know, just being kind of on the surface. Um, I like the fact that this opportunity here will be, be able to give, um, like, for example, one of the, the modules is going to be climate services and impact modeling. And, um, you know, so you're going to be able to analyze. Uh, I know some of the classes here talk about uh, how, how you're going to be able to, like, this isn't my class, but for example, there, there's like a flood a class talking about floods and everything. So you'd be able to do modeling and be able to do analysis. Not my classes, that's not in my program, but hopefully I'll get to audit it. But, you know, just being able to um, learn how to do the models, uh, learn how to um, do the stakeholder engagement from their perspective, not from our perspective as, um, okay, we're the recipient in the Caribbean and you know, have to jump through this hoop and that hoop. But from the perspective of these are the professionals who go in, most of the time, they're the ones we call on. And so what sort of skill set do they have? What are they looking for? When they do their reports, what does that look like in its fullness and completeness um, that is expected? Uh, because they ha these are the people who hand this. I'm, the school that I'm in is um, University of Reading is... Um, their meteorology department is really great and very strong. So you have a lot of people here who may have worked on the IPCC report or um, work at the Met office and everything. So you have, so here I have the opportunity to learn directly from them. And hopefully that would be receptive when I go back home. <laughs> but if not, well, I mean, there are other things that one can do. <laughs> Uh, were there any questions from anyone? Wow. I have a lot of questions, but I'm afraid time is going to be limiting us. But there's so many, so many. I, I did not expect this conversation to evolve into, yeah, like, you know, even how we learn about AI and the for education system, you know, how we acquire, how we even get access into these uh, knowledge systems, right? And then uh, how we translate it into the employment sector, how we get jobs, how we make um, how we make use of this knowledge is also very interesting. Uh, Anthony's or oh, Nikita, there's so many questions. I was just taking some notes um, from your talk, uh, Glenice, especially yeah. Please, Anthony's yeah. She just switched on That's the mic. Fair. I'm sorry. Um, not so much as a questions, but like Abby was saying, um, it's it was a, it's a lot of information. Um, I learned a lot. I screenshot the different websites, so I'm gonna check those out. And I love the Medi app. That's the app we were using just now to answer the questions. I feel like that is such a great app because it um it helps to keep people engaged, especially like people who don't know too much about um, the AI field and stuff like that. So it's like, okay, I'm in this Zoom meeting, but I also can use this app and see how it, it works or what's not. But great presentation. I love um, everything about it and AI technology. And one thing I would have to say, um, would work in and I mean being a part of this field and stuff like that for a little while is that communication is a big thing you know especially um sometimes it's hard for people or sometimes it's hard for me to express myself um with communication so I'm trying to build up my communication skills 
but I, I really love that app. That app is wonderful. And I, I just love the whole presentation. Like Abby said, it was so much. And I took my little notes down too. And also you kind of break my heart when you were saying like how um, you have your degrees and stuff like that and still going in these fields and people are looking at you just by taking one look at you and, you know, feel like you're not worthy or what's what's not I can definitely um relate to that but I know you're doing such an awesome job and again great presentation thank you thank you very much I'm really glad wow. you enjoyed it and yeah I think uh if you have any further questions you could always get in contact with them <laughs> and um if any of those relate directly to me then they could get in contact with me <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, awesome. yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, um, I, I like the questions you're raising in your presentation, um, especially when it comes to um, when, when, when you're trying to ask the underlining, the underlining uh, skills you need to access these technologies, right? The foundational skills, though, whether if it's digital literacy and how you kind of framed it, uh, how it became more specific. These are the exact questions we are trying to understand. Even Antonis was mentioning communication, right? Mm -hmm. You see, you've mentioned a lot of these AI applications, a lot of the application areas that it can be useful in, whether if it's image generation, text recognition there's so much so much you cannot we cannot finish it in just one session but one of the questions we wanted to ask ourselves during this whole ai green lab session series was what is the low-hanging fruit we can tap into what is the basic foundation what what is the entry point we can consider um uh, in in using these technologies for our benefit and the, the most common themes that emerged was the ones that um, I'm happy that it merged with your presentation and some of the things you're questioning, right? Data gaps. I, you did mention about data gaps. There's a lot of data gaps. Um, we need to understand and what data are we trying to make? How do we make sense of our natural environment around us? How do we quantify things? Those were one of the things. The second uh, was, of course, communication. Um, how do we, it's an essential human need, right? It's an essential human need, irrespective of cultures, geographic location, we're still trying to um, work as a team. So this was a, this would be a nice transition point to go to our next uh, session, right, Nikita? Um, for our reflection session. We, we might not have time to reflect on all three, but on all three, which is communication, data, and heritage, right? Knowledge, general arts, creative, and cultures. But let's just focus on the communication part because that's what we're doing right now. We're in different time zones, different locations, different uh, backgrounds and interests and expertise, but yet we're still trying to communicate. I'll give you an example, just a few, if you, okay, before that, let me just share the Google Doc on this uh, chat group so that we're all on the same page, literally. And then uh, we can, uh, yeah. Has everyone got access? So I'm just going to go ahead and log in. Um, did you share it in the main chat? Yes, on the main chat. Oh, so, yeah. Okay, you got it? Yes, I do. Thank you. So it's the reflection sheet. So this is the first page. You're going to see notes on guest speaker's presentation, uh, which we were just going through at the moment. But feel free to add further as well, but of course, if you go to the part where you can see AI for communication, I'm gonna read out a case, which is 
basically our case, which uh, we experienced in co-creating this uh, working group, right, on AI Green Lab. So as I was saying, good communication is essential in building communities. So what does that mean? The global virtual teams experience with the YMEs, for example, as you can see, we're, we're trying to understand how these tools can help virtual teams operate better. So for example, I'll just read out the whole case and then so that it can help us reflect um, on, the, on the case. So Jade is assembling a group of five young Bahamians for year-long learning, um, learning, right, in general. So excuse that typo, learning. It was supposed to be on an island classroom, just the one you're just seeing, similar to the one you're seeing. Some of these sessions will need to be con conducted virtually, but she has some concerns. All five of the team members are from different islands. And what are some of the technological barriers this virtual team could face, could potentially face, right? And additionally, her team is collaborating with another small island nation team from Africa who are working on, on the same project. So what I would like us to do is, considering communication at the heart of this conversation, what what are some of the technological barriers this team could face? Um, it could be access to internet, data. I mean, beyond that, what? so I'll just leave it there and we can quickly reflect on that and see where AI could fill in some of these gaps and also identify the limitations. So we're not just being here, oh, AI is going to do everything, it's going to solve our, all our problems, but we're just being pragmatic and practical on where it's reached its limitation, where it could have biases, um, and for us to identify this, this line between practicality and also the feasibility of where we're at right now in terms of access and barriers and all of these things. So I'll go ahead and also drop my, my thoughts. How many minutes do we have, Nikita? Uh, or if there is any questions, anything yeah. on that's not clear? Um, if anyone wants to sort of maybe sort just of respond, maybe just in, mm -hmm. say, yeah, let's reflect. Yeah. Even ver verbally, is fine. Yeah. I can also take notes. Well, yeah. Well. I guess the big thing is, is that there's a lot of assumptions, right, that be, are made. So when you're joining a team, the assumption is that everyone has access to the same type of computer with the same processing skills and ability, um, the same internet bandwidth, uh, you know, and so that is obviously not the case, especially throughout our reflected, our respective regions. Um, and something I learned really in Interestingly, this year, we had, um, we gave a laptop to one of our fellows in Ethiopia. Uh, it was an Apple laptop. And we like the hoops that we had to go through to ship this laptop from the Bahamas to Ethiopia was amazing. You know, we had to, it was like passing it from one friend to a next through different like locations in the United States to get to um, the Ethiopian yeah. Airlines hub so someone could take it over for us um but what i realized was even though this air Mac macbook air was in ethiopia with our fellow she did not have strong enough internet or reliable internet and as a result the laptop was just a paperweight for about six months until I was able to get there and purchase her an internet box that could support her computer use. Um, and so I use that as an example is you can have the best technology ever, but in the absence of all the pieces, you know, like your technology is just pointless. Uh, 
So that was a real important learning for me that made me realize that like when we do technology transfers, you know, you can't, you can't half do a technology transfer, you know, and I think a lot of times in the development world, developing just space, when we talk technology transfers, we talk, they're not full, right? We'll give like a, we'll give a tablet, but it's kind of the crummy tablet. It's not a good tablet, you know, like, so we kind of do it, but we don't do it to the best of our ability because I think maybe we're thinking, oh, I'm going to save money. But at the end of the day, if I have a tablet that I can't really work on, am I saving money? No, because I'm going to have to get a new tablet anyways to do the work. So it ends up being a greater expense at the end of the day. So I think these are things that I have been reflecting on as it relates to technology and technology being able to support. Because this is an example, right? Uh, Malet, who we, the fellow, the whole point was to give her a computer so she could work more efficiently because she was working from her phone. Um, but that actually just, just because she had a computer, it didn't improve efficiency because the internet wasn't there. Right. So, um, yeah, that's one of my reflections. Um, one thing that, um, as Nikita was speaking, I was reminded of because I, I yeah. used to be in, um, different parts of the world or visit different parts of the world. So, um, one thing I noticed even coming here is that my Disney and my Netflix are not the same as my Disney and my Netflix in the Bahamas. <laughs> um, and uh, being in different countries, uh, even just jumping from the Bahamas to the States, obviously, uh, I found that certain, you could have maybe access to the same service overall, but the services that they offer specifically are not um, always enabled for, for the countries that you go to. And the more third world it is, the less <laughs> uh, features might be enabled. So something that um, you might be able to do, um, depending on what sort of software program um, that they're using in NASA, uh, may, I mean, you have to question if it's even downloadable, depending on what country that they're in. I don't know which countries they're in. Um, so uh, you have to wonder if it's uh, even allowed in that country. Um, there are certain learning platforms when I go to, they have a list of countries where they don't operate in uh, for different embargoes or whatever. So I think that's something you have to consider when you are um, using certain softwares, um, if you have the same features and the capabilities. Um, another thing is um, with Excel, um, you have to pay for the services for Excel generally, unless you're viewing something. So if they... So if you, you can't take for granted, if you're using Excel, that somebody else is going to be able to do that. And I remember when we had um, a workshop, um, and I was consulting on, on something back in NASA. And um, in the workshop, they were supposed to use Excel to do this analysis. And some people opened it up in Google Sheets. And certain features that were in Excel did not behave. I wouldn't even say to see <laughs> they did not behave at all. <laughs> Uh, sometimes things look distorted or um, I actually came across a little rounding issue um, uh, that, that was a little weird, but um, you have to consider all these different um, variables because the, the sheets behave differently. Uh, so you have to do some standardization um, to in order to, if you, especially if you're collecting data in order to have good data quality um, set up. What's mm. interesting that because they do and we operate I mean I don't I can't tell you the last time I've actually had a Microsoft subscription you know like I have been using Google for a very long time it started originally just because I didn't have the money to afford the Microsoft subscription and Google you know platforms worked but then uh, we now use Google as a company and so you know, everything now is integrated with that. Um, but it, it, I think it is that, that conversation about access and who has access to resources is a big thing. And it's, it's definitely an assumption that a lot of people make. Um, and then learning even how to code switch, if you will, between different platforms, even something as simple as Zoom, Google Chat, and teams, you know, I 
different communication platforms all require different sort of learning curves as you as you sort of begin to use them. So yeah, this is very interesting. So to keep it, um, so one of the reflection points uh, we wanted to focus on in shaping the research question on AI for practical applications and some of and considering its limitations was. For example, when it comes to communication, we we understand its power, but at the same time, there's cer certain uncharted areas areas of AI, and and its unintended consequences. I'll give you an example. Like all of a sudden, over the last few months, or I don't know, all of a sudden everyone became good in writing, <laughs> and then. <laughs> impeccable grammar and everyone seems to have a very like it's just and then I'm I'm a bit worried I'm scared by that trend because it kind of detached that human you know creativity and sense like you don't really hear the person talking I feel like sometimes I just quickly lose interest when I see you can even tell it's an AI generated LinkedIn post maybe that person genuinely wanted to share something. It's fine. They wanted to share some, some insight, uh, and I'm I'm good. I, I I'm fine with that. I'm reading the whole thing, but I still would have preferred to hear more from that person, even with a broken uh, English like mine, or like you know, with being my second language. I would have preferred hearing that. So, where is this thing heading? Like, where is this trend going further? If we're if we're continuing to, I feel like it's a misuse of the AI tool itself because the primary function of these tools was to, I mean, the ideal, in my perspective, um, the ideal usage of these tools would have been to assist you in, to enable to free up some time and energy so that you can focus on your core competencies, which is thinking, which is actually solving problems. And then I'll give you an example. Um, just when we were trying to summarize the two sessions, we just, uh, with Nikita, we just, um, we're using this function called, uh, it's a Chrome extension for YouTube summary. I was just quickly mentioning it earlier on. And it did, it did the job well. It did summarize the, like a two hour session and it did point out the, the important notes. But the problem was that it did miss the human where like um, where we had in-depth discussion on certain topics, where there's a, the tones, the highs and the lows. Maybe someone got, um, you know, there's some details missing, right? So how do we consider these things? Um, uh, in when when we're when you're using these tools, uh, can we draw a line in which we is there like a box good usage of AI and bad usage of AI or how do we consider the unintended consequences, uh, the genericness of things being too sounding too robotic, and are these risks, or are they manageable, or like these are some of the things uh, I'm considering. Um, this is really interesting because I received, I'm now, every time I read something, I am going back to your original point about um, the tone, the tonality of writing and that personal uh, authenticity in the messaging. And sometimes I find that these AI generated um text are just so they're they're very fact heavy right because that's what ai does it it gathers information so it can like overload information in um sort of in i think some of the writing it's almost sometimes it's like almost a bit too much for me when i um reading that or if i and it, it, this is what makes me go, hmm, because sometimes with students, and I, I have definitely been with my students, encourage people to use AI as a tool, right? Like 
find help you find like citations or help you just help it let it support you but don't let it make you look stupid because it can do that as well you know and so you are like you're the one to blame if ai you know plays you for the fool because you should be thinking not the machine but um but i i guess um my reflection to that last point sorry i kind of lost my my train of thought um but I think there's something to be said about the importance of keeping our voice as the author or as the human, because just because I can regurgitate information and maybe AI is pushing us to a, a higher level of thinking and learning as humans, because like when you think about um, when you think about school, right, and we've done a lot of memorize this and then regurgitate that right that's what a lot of our learning is like um however and that's what ai does very well but maybe you know the the birth of ai is going to radically transform um how we get to then use our free free brain space so those are my reflections i'm noticing the time so i do want to respect everyone's time but maybe we could do a quick yeah one. thank you for sharing the for sharing that nikita yeah so there's definitely a lot to talk about but let's pause here uh there if time allowed we would, the second reflection point was on data in which glennis we can further uh, discuss that another maybe outside this uh, session but there's a lot of one of the moving forward one of the questions we wanted to consider uh, or answer more based on our relative um, work experiences and and, um, and and current actual work that we're doing is how do we draw the line between uh, a practical and good ethical and beneficial use of AI and then also uh, the harmful and unintended consequences of AI, whether individually or collectively, as as a as a community, like so, there. These are the two polar we're trying to understand and find a balance between. Uh, find a middle ground. There's always there should always be a middle ground, right, between two different polarities. So that's ideally that's what we're trying to reach. And thank you so much, everyone, for sharing your thoughts, reflections, insights. I definitely learned a lot. Um, but yeah, anything if you want to close, uh, Nikita? I'll say thank you so up. much um, for joining us again for our AI Greeting Lab webinar. This was another great deep dive. Um, Glenys, thank you so much for joining and contributing. It was great to see so many different Cat Island community members pop in and out throughout our conversation tonight. Um, if you're watching the replay, uh, definitely come and join us during our next session. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day and we will see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Yeah.